Many Hoops exists in the world for uh, for one reason, uh, one reason only. We exist to to rescue children from situations of injustice and equip them to become the adults who can do that for other people. Hi, and welcome to How We Change the World podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Rowan, and I truly appreciate your being here, whether you're watching a video or listening to the podcast. Now, my guest today is an Irishman named Thomas Kuhn. He is the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Many Hopes, which he started about 15 years ago to help rescue children who are living horrific lives in countries around the world. And the, what Many Hopes does is to first educate them, house them, and eventually get them through college if they so desire. The idea is that in 30 to 40 years, those children will be able to help the children growing up behind them so that charities will be no longer necessary. But Thomas was born on a sheep farm in Northern Ireland, and his career has been fascinating and his work deeply impactful. So be sure to check out the full show notes with photos on our website, along with very important links to view what I think is a very powerful and uplifting film called The Rising, which talks about the work they've already accomplished and the goals they have set for the future. I think between Thomas's compelling interview and along with this video, you may be looking for ways that you can help. And so you'll find links there for that as well. So now if you would just take a second to press that trusty subscribe button and sit back and relax and listen to this conversation between me and my guest, Thomas Kuhn. Hello, Thomas Kuhn. How, how, okay, I'm going to start again. How do you say your name? Kuhn. 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 Uh, well, how do you say it? You tell me and I'll tell you the correct version. Let's hear you. Kuhn. Very good. That's not bad. That's close. Kuhn. Imagine that it rhymes oh, with moan and groan and bone and stone. And Stick a K in the front. Kuhn. Okay. Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn. Uh, you have a little extra Kuhn. I got a bit All of right. a sharp, yeah. A, a sharp yeah. K, not a soft C. Kuhn. Kuhn. All right. <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave this part in. All right. Yeah. Welcome, Thomas Kuhn. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Oh, very good. Let's do that. Yeah, I shall, no, I'll, 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 I'll change it immediately. <laughs> All right. Welcome to How We Change the World podcast. Thanks for being on. Yeah, no, gracious. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big title. So, uh, it's a big title, but I think you're up to the challenge. It seems how you've been changing the world for quite a while now, which is a great, great segue to get into your story. Uh, well, we, uh, yeah, as, a, as a wise person once said to me, if we all do a little bit, no one has to do it at all. So we all do our little yes, bit. Yes, the, the key is getting up. everyone to do a little bit, right? That's the real key. So, um, all right. Well, everyone can tell already from your accent that you're not around from these parts. Not around these parts. You are no, uh, Belfast that, born or near Belfast? That is true. Yeah, near there. So from, uh, from Northern Ireland. I often say Belfast because most people haven't heard of most places in Northern Ireland. So about, mm -hmm. from a small sheep farm about 45 miles south of Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh, so is, that sheep farm, is, that, uh, is that farm still in your family? It is. That sheep farm has been in the family for, I, I think, uh, for more generations than, have, uh, than, than paper has existed for. So as far back as we can trace it. See, this is beautiful because this is not so much the case in the United States anymore. And I, I was telling you just before we started that my family, my dad's side of the family came from County Cork and mm. we have a dairy farm there. I say we, oh, they probably wouldn't we. say we talking about it, the American side of the family, but they still have a dairy farm. And I think same thing, generations for going back before anyone can remember. So uh, yeah. it's a lovely legacy as are many Irish legacies, I would say. Um, so, uh, so we're neighbors, ish. Ish, yeah. Well, at least we can go visit each other if we're oh. both in that town, which we couldn't have done back when you were uh, back when you were a kid. So, you want? Do, can we? Can we just? Uh, I, I want to get right into many hopes, but um, all right, let's do that. Let's start. I want to introduce many hopes and hmm. tell you how I found out about you, and then we'll back up and get your your story, your oh, origin yeah. story, as they say. So last, it was not, I don't know when this was, maybe a month ago, I'm scrolling through Instagram and this video comes on and I'm watching it for maybe 10 seconds and I am in 
hook, line, and sinker. And I don't know if you know that phrase, maybe it's not an Irish oh, phrase. Yes. I know it. <laughs> anyway, I was in just, it was the most riveting video. And, you know, usually attention spans on there are very quick, mm. mine included. But the story of what you're doing with Many Hopes, which is an organization that you founded and are executive director, you, right? That's right. Still to this day. Still um, to this day. To this day. And what you, you had produced this movie called The Rising, which I think must have just come out quite recently. But that is what I saw, the movie The Rising. And I would just tell everybody, and I'll put it in the show notes, of course, but before we even go on, <laughs> this little... 18 20 minute film i'm not sure how long it was but 18 good memory yeah i don't I can't believe i remember that uh it's it just tells the story of your organization and how it started and what you do and if you can get through there whether irish or not with a dry eye i will be amazed because it's a very very compelling beautiful story in its hope and in its promise but also in the the sadness of what's happening so if you could maybe just start by describing many hopes and what you're doing right now with the organization is mission and why you did it, why you started it. Well, thank you for that. We've got to get you to write a, uh, write a review of the rising film <laughs> then. Because, I will do uh, that. I'd love to. When we made that, we hoped that people would react the way that you described. So uh, that's, mm -hmm. it's an encouraging day for me so far. Good. Yes, many hopes, many hopes exists in the world for, uh, for one reason, uh, one reason only we exist to, to rescue children, from situations of injustice and equip them to become the adults who can do that for other people if they choose to. Mm. So rescuing children from things like modern day slavery, trafficking, sexual abuse, or just a simple lack of access to education, healthcare through mm. abandonment, having been orphaned, and to, to get them into a, into a safe, nurturing place to live access to an excellent education that gives them mm -hmm. a shot at being an adult who influences their community, doesn't just subsist or survive within it. So uh, mm -hmm. if Many Hopes succeeds, if we succeed in 30, 40 years time, then outside charity won't be necessary in any community where we've been active because local survivors, people who've been through a terrible injustice themselves mm -hmm. are leading and winning the fight against that where they're at. That's what, so it's a, wow. long, a long, long game. It's a long game. It's amazing because you must have known from the very get-go that it was a long game. I saw a video you recorded, I think, in 2014. Mm. Same story. Exactly the same story you're telling today, which says a lot. Only I know you've expanded and you've broadened the horizon for where you serve, but your mission is exactly the same, which is very, very powerful, I think. It yeah, hasn't changed. Know. There's a, there's, a, there's an old piece of wisdom that says the uh, an old piece of wisdom that says something like the most important thing between heaven and earth is long obedience in the same direction. So we've tried to be uh, we have been oh. uh, obedient to the same vision for uh, oh. for a long time. Mm. Most people do not have that uh, in this day. I'm talking about mm. everywhere in the world. It's it's rare. People want change fast. They want change in a year or two to say we're going to be, well, okay, so it's been 15 years since you started. Now you're saying in 30 to 40 years, that goal may be reached, that you're trying to reach. I, I kind of interpret a little bit that your goal was to get, um, although I don't know if you said this specifically, but was to get all children in school and even through college if they want. Um, is that That's one of the goals, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, estimates are that there's something approaching 258 million children uh, today who can mm. access school. So we as an organization won't stop until every one of those children have the chance mm. to get uh, into school and get an education. Now, how we do that isn't mm. by us as a charity. Us as an, an Irish person leading an American-based organization won't do that. The way that big change like that will happen is mm -hmm. through us doing our little bit, which is getting as many children as we can into school, mm -hmm. knowing that many of them will grow up and do the same thing. So as together, uh, the, the biggest number of people uh, will be reached more than any organization by themselves could. So we're, we're equipping others to multiply mm -hmm. uh, what it is that we're doing for them. 
And the, the cascading event, uh, effects of having, especially girls, but girls and boys educated, is uh, so beyond even the confines of what you're trying to do because climate change, I know one of the major things, uh, I don't know if you know Paul Hawken, he wrote this book, 100 Ways to uh, Fix Climate Change. It's not the exact title. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. But number four, I believe, was educating girls because girls who are educated then don't go on to have 10 or 12 children. They typically naturally reduce their family size. They're more interested in bringing, you know, their, their worldview kind of broadens. So, and, and, and that has so many cascading effects on society, right? Because the, there's less violence, there's less troubles of all kinds. So yeah, even, uh, even a, every extra year of primary or secondary education that a girl receives mm. increases the likelihood that uh, she will uh, get married later, will choose to get married, mm -hmm. will have fewer children and will be much better equipped to raise mm -hmm. uh, those children will, and her lifetime earnings are boosted with every extra year of school that that girl gets yeah. access to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how it has not even been solved yet. But um, well, let, I'm going to take a little detour and then I promise we'll come back because I really want to get into the nuts and bolts of, of how your program works. But just so people know who you are first, if you, um, I know, you're, like you said, you're born in a town, uh, Northern Ireland, on a sheep farm, I should say. Um, yes. Then you went to university, and then the first job you had was in the parliament, or I don't know if it was a job, even uh, as a researcher mm. working on the Troubles. That's amazing. How old were you? Because that's just, for itself, it was, a huge story. <laughs> yeah, that was, growing up in Northern Ireland, uh, the what we very euphemistically referred to as the Troubles, it was a, mm. a political, pretty violent political conflict that started in the late 60s and mm. didn't end until 1998. And so being born in there, the first item on the news most days was a, a mm. bomb that went off. In childhood, yeah. a bomb went off, a bomb was defused, and everyone around me knew somebody who had lost a family member or a friend or a neighbor, someone they knew, everyone had been touched. and. I suppose whenever mm. you grow up in an environment like that, you have a couple of options. You can go one of two ways. You can either become part of perpetuating mm. a problem uh, mm -hmm. because terrible things have happened to people that you know and you're rightly angry, or you can think maybe maybe something can be different here. Maybe this doesn't have to be uh, this mm. way. Unfortunately, due to mostly the influence of my very strong, very loving family, uh, mm -hmm. Very it, it, idyllic family. Uh, the, it, I chose option two. I was always quite politically involved. Had a lot of, uh, as a teenager, had a lot of mm. anger, I suppose, mm -hmm. or anger or bitterness against, in quotes, the other side. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, I ended up because the family influences taking the, the decision to get involved in a Huge constructive way. Ended up working mm -hmm. for one of the two political parties that signed and then implemented the peace agreement in 1988. I was very, I was just a, around a college age and beyond, so I was very low on the on the totem pole there, but yeah. to be close to. To be on most, it. Yeah. Mostly I was writing writing speeches that weren't read out very much or rolled up and mm -hmm. branded for emphasis quite a lot, but, but to be near something so significant as that taught yeah. me the lesson that we've carried into many hopes, and that lesson being seemingly unsolvable or massive intractable problems can and do have solutions if enough people bring their own individual influence to bear on them. Mm. Uh, and so we've, we've carried that lesson through to everything we've done since. Actually, that's exactly the question I wanted to ask you is, is was that seeing that there is something that actually gets solved because so often that is people's frustration with every major problem that we're facing in the world is that you see, not only do we see so little progress, but we see it getting things getting worse in so many areas. So for you to be actually sitting in parliament, writing speeches when in the midst of it and, and your boss, maybe not your direct boss, but getting winning a Nobel laureate, right? Winning a Nobel prize. Yeah. I mean, um, for, it's true. Peace yes. Pretty yeah, amazing. 
No, it was, it was remarkable uh, at that age. Yeah. It was a very, very uncommon experience to have. Yes, the, yeah. the big, the big boss, uh, the leader yeah. of our party, shared the Nobel Peace Prize the next year, uh, mm. and but you, you don't get to be near that very often. Yeah, no, that had to have I'm a not- tremendous effect. Tremendous, with hope. So, so then, why did you leave and come to the United States? Because that, after that, that's mm. what you did. Right next, right? Yeah. So I, I ended up shortly after that, then moving to Boston, Massachusetts, where there are people often say, oh, there's lots of Irish people there, which there were, but I uh, mostly tried to try to avoid them. I thought, I can, I can talk <laughs> to Irish people at home. I don't need to come across, across right. the ocean to see people. That I, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, I was sent to Boston to do another oh, job were... related to the peace process at home, and that was some hmm. of the politicians, some American British mm-hmm. and Irish politicians who had been involved in the yeah. peace process in Northern Ireland had mm-hmm. identified something. They saw that, yes, it's fine for lots of elected representatives to sign an agreement that says we have peace now, but there's a big gap between that and young people who are coming from areas most affected by those years of violence, by young people who maybe have never had a job themselves, have come from families where they're parents or even grandparents perhaps uh, didn't have employment and all they knew was the conflict. All they knew was I'm going to fight in with a, those people. You're talking about youth in Ireland, right? In Ireland, yeah, on both yeah, sides. Okay. Which few, right. they recognized, essentially, a group of the politicians from America, Britain and Ireland recognized that there is an economic reality here that fuels uh, violence and conflict, just like oh, I suppose right. in American cities, uh, yeah, areas everywhere. where there is the lowest levels of employment, there are probably the highest levels of, of gang yeah. violence, for, for example. Right. So they thought, well, how do we make sure? How do we make sure that this peace agreement holds? How do we help some of these communities uh, to okay. both talk to each other and enter employment? So what they did was they created a program that brought young people, young people from America did. The State Department created a program that brought young people from both oh. sides of the divide in Northern Ireland different cities in America for two years of paid employment. With two two years? Two that's years. a long well, time. Oh, yeah. It's a, that's a proper immersive experience. No, with, it is. But I was involved with that with Iraqis and, and, and other mm. other countries and coming to the U.S., but it was a month. Well, that's almost two years to teach. Fantastic. That makes so much more sense. Well, you don't just come on vacation then. You're, right. you're coming and you'll be changed. And the, yeah. the twin goals of the program were that every participant that came from an, an economically affected area, mostly in the in the cities and, and, and in mm-hmm. Belfast, would come and they would first of all learn, oh, we're, we're not that different after all. These things we've been right. fighting over are important. We can mm-hmm. have political differences, but they're not worth killing or dying over. Number right. one. Number two, oh, it feels good to work. It feels good to have cash on the hip and to pay my way. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And then they go back to Northern Ireland and their influence Beautiful. disseminates wow. outwards. So I was employed to come and help implement that program oh. uh, at the beginning uh, so that's how i ended up in america so was it who employed you was it the u.s state department it was oh it, so was. it was the state department well state department oh, so interesting so subcontractors but ultimately yeah it was a state department program wow that's a fascinating job that was so that, well, yeah well my it was right after it was right after 9-11 and so my first job was persuading american companies to hire unseen mm largely unskilled Northern Irish folks right after uh, 9-11 happened and a recession was wow. about to hit. So that yeah. made fundraising for many hopes pretty easy later on. You got a lot of no's in that job. Oh, I My see. My job was to go and persuade American companies to hire people yeah. at a time they were laying people off. I see. So yeah, I got rejected so, for a living. Yeah. <laughs> good good sales training. No, was, no, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, no, Maybe no, no, a, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the yeses probably weren't that frequent. Oh, so that I I didn't get that part of your story. That's really that's really interesting. But then you became a, a writer, a, a journalist after that, and so did that yes. program just naturally end, or, or I assume that, it ended at one point. The program this ended two year program. It, it was a two year program, and uh, Congress renewed it two or three times, so it lasted uh-huh. five or six years in the end. But yeah, at the same time as that, I was writing. Mm-hmm. Back to the speech writing again, but writing yeah. for newspapers uh, in Ireland and in the U.S. And I had a, had a weekly opinion column in, in not a oh. 
not a very good newspaper, a free newspaper, but one that was very widely read, a paper called the Metro newspaper that published mm -hmm. every day, every weekday in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. so every Wednesday. I had 500 words to It's a great audience. That's tell a great experience. Something. Yeah. Well, the best thing about writing opinion columns is that everyone's the, everyone's the world's leading authority on their own opinion. So uh, <laughs> I, I knew no my opinion No fact-checking necessary. <laughs> no. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Wait, you didn't write every day, did you? Did you have a once piece a on it? Oh, once, once a week. Once a week. Yeah, because that, that would be a difficult, difficult to even have that many opinions, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, All it right. would be. So, so maybe we should skip ahead a little bit, although I was really curious about the next part, but I just want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about mm -hmm. many hopes. But um, unless there's something you want to you wanna throw in about your next steps, because I, you know, I, know, I know you worked with Irish. Maybe that was to set you had a seven-year stint with an Irish immigration Maybe, was that, is that what you were referring to? Is that what yes, that was? Yes, it okay. was. So All right, that makes more sense. State Got Department it. contracted them to implement the program in Boston. Okay. So, because I was confused about that. I thought I didn't know that Irish immigrants were still needing so much support when they came to the United States. Because I just saw that there's an immigration, Irish immigration center in Boston. And I just, it kind of surprised me that that was still a thing. Because there's so uh, many yes. for people coming from Africa and coming from the Middle East, and there's a lot of centers like that, but I, you don't see it for Irish anymore. So that, well, that's I was confused. that's true. Yeah, the the organization that I worked for implementing this program in Boston was called the Irish Immigration Center. It then changed its name to the Irish International Immigration Center because we served immigrants and refugees oh. from over 100 countries. It just happened oh. to be started by Irish people, yeah, I uh, see. And so that the name yeah. was a bit deceptive. Yeah. All right. So then you're on this vacation, I guess, traveling when you when you yeah. went to Kenya. So, what, were you, what were you doing then? So many hopes ended up starting by accident, I suppose. Uh, not, mm -hmm. It was started unintentionally, at least, while writing for the papers. I used to travel a lot. I had freedom mm -hmm. to travel and was always was curious. was never curious as a child, uh, but became more curious later in life mm -hmm. for some reason. Mm -hmm. And traveled to Kenya, Kenya and Tanzania on, in right in the east coast of Africa yeah. to do a safari and lie on the beach and drink cheap beer and take pictures yeah. of animals that my father couldn't raise on an Irish farm. But while I was there, <laughs> I just started to see in Kenya things that were the, just the most unjust, unfair things that I'd seen at that age of my life. I thought, yeah. that, what I seen, I thought that what I'd seen in Northern Ireland was unjust and unfair, mm. seeing how children and young people my age were having to live and the things I had to deal with I never mm. had to I didn't have to worry about dying of hunger of not right. being able to have a bed to sleep in uh, mm. I just started to meet children that were living horrific lives and I met one I met a Kenyan what, journalist what in Kenya okay go ahead I was just asking which country you're in when, when you oh so this, this, was, so in, this, this is was in Kenya Mm -hmm. This was in Kenya, so went to Kenya, did the did the holiday bit, or the vacation, on the mm -hmm. safari, and then, and then I met a Kenyan journalist, a much better journalist than I could ever hope to be, a very very bright, very capable mm -hmm. reporter for TV and for for news, and he had had a just he was a remarkable man. He had he had he had had an experience that changed his life. He met boys used to follow him in the street with his big camera where mm -hmm. he'd sometimes turn the viewfinder on them and they'd go, hey, we're on TV, you're on TV. Yeah. And, and he began to befriend boys who lived in the streets and ate from the dump sites and mm -hmm. begged from tourists and they began to trust him. And then they introduced him to a girl called uh, Gift or Zawadi in Swahili. He's referenced in our film that you watched. And Gift was six Crazy years old history. when she lost her mother to HIV. She never knew her father, so she was left begging for food in the street by herself, carrying her infant brother uh, on her back, her baby brother, unaware that her brother was dead already while she carried him around Mombasa seeking food. And this Kenyan journalist thought two things when he met Gift. He thought, number one, this is not right. Children in my country, shouldn't, no child anywhere should be begging for food in the street, never mind carrying a dead sibling on their back. And number two, mm. I am complicit in this. I am a man of influence in this country, and I'm not currently using it for anything mm. other than myself. And he then refocused his journalism 
on giving a voice to the voiceless and raising issues uh. of injustice. And he and I became friends, and we both realized, uh. as people who were quite maybe cynical or skeptical about the effectiveness of aid or charity internationally, uh, I'd grown up always being told, you know, F finish your dinner. There are children starving in Africa. My mother would say, uh, yeah. or or seeing always. fundraiser after fundraiser and think, well, why why are nothing seems to be changing? Is it? Why isn't it? Uh, why isn't it working? Why isn't it? Yeah. And he and, and I just, I think, united on that. Him from a receiving country and me from a giving country, if we're using clumsy language. But both of us observed gift and other children mm. like her, and we thought, goodness, they are, as, they're brighter than we are. Uh, gift is brighter than we are. She has a desire to see things be different in her community mm. and in her country, just like I did in Northern Ireland, desired what I was growing up in with the violence and trouble to be different. I could access education to act on that desire. I had the support of a loving family to mm. be able to act to be able to act on that desire. She didn't imagine, we thought, imagine if we could give gift yeah. and ten, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand other children who've experienced something she has, access to the education in their heads, the confidence in their bellies and the network of each other at their fingertips to match mm -hmm. that desire in their hearts. That's game changing in 30 years, we thought. So let's start doing that. And then we started. Oh, so you started with this journalist that he, he was also a founder? Or we co -founder started of the org in the very oh, beginning. He was, okay. uh, he, and he was the, 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 the leader uh, in Kenya. He was, he was already advocating for wow. and rescuing and housing and educating children. Yeah. Uh, and then I realized I can't do what you can do, but you can't pay for it. I know people at home mm. in Northern Ireland and in America who desire mm. to do good in the world, the desire to mm. live impactful lives, mm -hmm. but maybe don't know how to, mm -hmm. or too busy to find out, or don't know who or what they can trust. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, yes. Let's give them something that's easy that, I, and that they can trust. Yeah. I think, um, not to skip too quickly over that point, because that was what you thought when you were in Kenya, um, I saw you or heard you say that somewhere that you you knew, and I, I grew up this way too. My dad always said, don't give money to charities, then it never gets to the people. And I grew up thinking that as well. And, and there are still many, many cases today where that is not the case. But what gave you, in fact, I think you said, I think you said there had been $2 trillion in aid. I saw this on uh, mm. some interview that had been given to maybe Africa in general. I don't think it was just to Kenya. And yet there were something like 250, 300 million kids mm. on the street. Still well, there are still, yeah, I mean, it, it, exactly I, that. The numbers are so large that you can't again, relate to them. Yeah. Approximately $1.2 trillion uh, of aid has been invested in the continent of Africa in the last 60 years. And good oh, things have happened, of course. I mean, no, right, of course, right. people, schools exist and folks are accessing right. clean water that they weren't before and uh, right. people are alive that wouldn't be but it, it doesn't it didn't seem to us that the root causes that necessitated mm -hmm. the continuation of those large aid dollars were going away it seemed like the six yeah. years on well clearly <laughs> clearly there's a lot left that yeah. was un, untapped well, I mean, why did you? Why did you? And and what, what was your partner's name? I guess maybe he's not involved anymore. I don't know. The, the, his name the was, journalist. Oh, his name was Anthony. Anthony. Why did you and Anthony think you had the ability to change it where others hadn't been successful? Hmm. I think what we realized, or we believed at the start, was that we didn't have the ability to be successful mm -hmm. where others weren't. We believed that the children mm -hmm. who had experienced an injustice had a stronger desire, a more tenacious appetite for making change in their communities than even mm. the best intentioned charity ever could. Just mm. like I had more desire to make Northern Ireland different and better mm. and peaceful than someone who didn't yeah. live there. Right. How could we how could we provide them with the tools that they needed to to do that? There was massive okay unrealized potential because, like I say, I was able to get to school and then high school and then college. The children that we were meeting were as smart as me, had the same desire as me, smarter than me, had the same desire as me, but couldn't get
get access to the tools, the yeah. schools they needed to act on it. So we thought we're not going to we're not going to solve the problems of the world as a charity. We're going to equip. We're going to raise up and equip the children who can. Uh, yeah. I grew up in the church. Uh, I still very much. I'm a I'm a Christian, and I look at even whether whether folks listening would call themselves Christians or wouldn't, they could probably acknowledge that. It was a guy. It was a guy called Jesus who spent most of his time investing in twelve people, and I think uh, I think mm. it was a, a writer <laughs> called a Eugene, analogy. Eugene yeah. Peterson who once said, uh, "Jesus just decided that investing in twelve <laughs> Jewish men was the best way to one day reach all <laughs> Americans." So pouring <laughs> a lot into a few who will reach the masses later is what mm -hmm. we started out trying to do. Oh, well, that was brilliant because you've already seen now you're fifteen years in, and you've already realized, or I don't know if you want to say you've realized the fruits, but Kenyan children and others have already mm. proven that your concept was correct and they're doing it, right? Like, yeah, yeah so have... talk, talk about gift a little bit, even though it, it is, this is in the movie, but still it's just, and, and when you say she was six years old, that just almost, that mm. really took my breath away because I saw the, the videos of her and, you know, it's probably mm. recreated because it's probably not that age anymore, but, um, I mean, yeah, gift I thought is, she was probably twelve or something when that happened, not six. Wow. Yeah, she was, she was six back it's then. Hard to imagine. She's in. Uh, she's so she's finishing college uh, at the mm -hmm. moment, so she's not quite done, but almost. But yeah. during vacations and weekends, she works along with our local partner in Kenya, and she's helping get others into school, and she's helping help going to do house visits to assess what someone's needs mm -hmm. and potential is. She's helped a peer of her set up a small business of her own uh, someone who wasn't academically gifted but had the ability to uh, create a revenue generating enterprise that gift helped her get off the ground so she's wow. even at a micro level yeah is she's doing it as a that's college how you student. learn it that's how you learn and it then bigger examples i suppose are the the many hopes partner leader we work there's, there's maybe two there's maybe two distinguishing things about many hopes not completely unique but maybe unusual one is that well 100 percent of any donation that anyone gives to us goes directly to mission goes directly to providing care and education because a, a group of private donors fund all of our overhead the second maybe unique thing or unusual thing is we we work entirely through local partners so we don't hire or send people from America or Ireland somewhere. We are always looking out for extraordinary local people mm -hmm. who will lead where they are. So our, our partner leader in Ghana is a great example of, for clumsy language for brevity, of the product of what we envision happening one day. His name is James. You saw him in the video too, perhaps? Yeah. I so did. our leader in Ghana is James. Yeah. And he was six years old as well, same age as Gift. James was sold into slavery on the fishing boats of Lake Volta in Ghana. Lake Volta is the largest man-made or human-made lake in the world. Uh, and it's this, the epicenter of the commercial fishing trade in Ghana. Children mm. are bought and sold by traffickers to slave masters who are fishermen to dive off boats and untangle fishing nets from trees that are below the surface. They lose their eyes and they lose their lives jumping into murky waters not knowing what's beneath. Jim lived mm. that life for seven years. Our leader in Ghana was enslaved from the age of six to the age of 13. At the age of 13, he escaped. And after going through elementary school, high school, college, he became a banker at Barclays. And he quit that job to go back to the same lake that he had endured seven years of slavery on. He's since rescued just over 1,800 other children, many of whom are today rescuing others. So we imagine, James, you could say, is a once in a generation person. Maybe, but why? He doesn't have to be. <laughs> yeah. Let's have yeah. 10,000 Jameses. That changes yeah. the conversation. So this, just, I want to maybe back up a little bit or go deeper a little bit on how this technically works because uh, I think maybe we haven't fully explained how you do this. Like, so how do you mm. find, how do you find people in Ghana? How do you find people in, I think you're in Guatemala now also in Peru, maybe? Is that one of the yeah, countries? So, uh, and six then countries. maybe six countries. Okay. And then also just what, maybe a little bit more explanation of what it is, because 
you're rescuing people that are clearly they're slaves or they're starving or whatever situation. And then what are you doing? Like what happens mm. next? So maybe you can talk about the process as you created it and, and, and also maybe finish talking about the six countries. Mm. Yeah, the, those, are, those, are, those are good questions and big questions. So the, the six countries that we have local partners in are in, on the continent of Africa, uh, Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi, and then Latin mm. America, Guatemala, Bolivia, and Peru. Okay. And in bricks and mortar terms, if you were to mm -hmm. physically visit, infrastructure in each location will look a bit different because the, w there's no one solution for, for every place in the world that looks exactly the same. But the mm -hmm. program that we deliver looks the same. So here's, okay. how, here's how it works. The sequence of what happens is think of three, three words, rescue, equip, and then launch. So the mm -hmm. phase one is just rescuing, rescuing children who are currently enduring some kind of abuse or violation. That could be slavery in Ghana, that could be sexual abuse in Kenya, it could be simple abandonment in Malawi. Mm -hmm. So getting a child out of a dangerous, violating situation into a safe place where they can live and be okay. nourished and nurtured. And then equip, so that is access to excellent education, an education that gives you a shot at getting to college if that is what you want. Not every mm -hmm. child would want to go to college. I For went sure. to college, my sister didn't, and she's living a great life. Yeah. Uh, so good education, excellent education. And then mentoring, career professional mentoring, and then third mm. in bucket two, maybe slightly unusually, workshops and lessons on how government works, on how the justice system works, uh. how to spot, how to know what your rights are, how to spot when they've been violated, and what to do about that. So as you know, when you see something in your neighborhood, that shouldn't happen. I know what mm -hmm. to do about that. I know who to call, I know what to say, and I have a reasonable chance I'll be listened to. Mm. So that's the longest of so rescue, equipping with all those tools over time, which takes place mm -hmm. either in homes that we run, in families that we place children into after rescue, or in the schools. Those are three delivery areas. And then finally okay. is launch. That is at the end of high school, what happens next? It's either seed money for small business, it's, mm. it's college, or it's help finding employment. So you're living as a flourishing independent adult. That is a huge undertaking. So you have homes where people, where children live, like they, Many Hopes owns these homes or these so facilities? Temporary, we, we partner locally with uh, local organizations who are well networked in the communities okay. where we are, who run mm -hmm. short term homes. Re or recovery centers or rehabilitation mm. centers or children's homes. They call mm -hmm. them different things in each place. But rescue happens and then a child will spend a temporary period, anywhere between three months and two years in one of these homes, just mm. healing, beginning to stabilize, getting yeah. medical and uh, emotional health care to recover from physical and emotional trauma, and then beginning yeah. some of those mentoring workshops, services we just talked about. Yeah. and then get either reintegrated or reunified with their family of origin, if that's a safe family, they go back mm. to their family, or an extended family member, or if there's no one safe there either, then what we in America might call a foster situation. They mm -hmm. go into a, to, for the net, right up until the end of their high school. Oh my goodness. This is, it's really a massive undertaking. I mean, this is it's, not a small thing. <laughs> That's the, I don't know. That's the long and term. It's a lot of, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of money. And you're able to, um, you're, you've been mm. able to raise because, okay, I just, I, I'm always wanting to back up, but just, I just, mm. things jump out at me because one of the things, and I know it's, you're not completely unique in this, but it, it is rare when an organization, first of all, okay. The topic I'm on is when someone gives a donation, it goes 100% of their donation goes to the the work. And yes. you said someone else pays their salary. So you, that I have heard of that model, but it's still sort of rare. So 100% of your, of the, or are you saying that 100% 
of the expenses of the organization, salaries, um, maybe infrastructure offices, mm. I don't know, all that kind of thing. That part is all covered by a separate fund? That yes, you, that's uh, that so is So you fundraise exactly. for both. You fundraise for both organizations or for both pieces of the organization? We do. Yeah? So, okay. yes, you imagine, I think the easiest way to think about it is that any expense that Many Hopes has that isn't directly a program expense, that isn't directly mm. serving a child, mm -hmm. is paid for by someone else. So if you go on our website right now and decide to make a donation, mm -hmm. unless you tell us otherwise, our assumption is that you want 100% of your donation to go directly to providing rescue care or education for a child. Okay. And then over yeah. here, we have a group of families uh, and one family foundation oh. in Wisconsin who have oh. opted in to say, hey, we want to cover the That's fundraising amazing. expenses, admin expenses, the technology, yeah. travel, anything that, that isn't programmed. So as no one needs to be in any doubt, we don't want any obstacle mm -hmm. to get in the way of someone who wants to support this work because they think, well, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure where the money goes. So they want to remove that right. obstacle right. from anyone's mind. Yeah, that's very powerful. I mean, I wish it, it didn't have to be that way, but because of fraud in the past and because of unsavory characters, it kind mm. of it, it kind of has become that way for charities and for nonprofits that um, people are hesitant. And, and honestly, like I had a, a woman on from Choose Love. I don't know if you've heard of that organization, oh, yeah. but um, Josie Naughton, just a wonderful know, human being. You know Josie? Yeah, I met Josie probably 10 years ago, before before Choose Love existed. Oh, well, Way Choose back Love in is just, that's amazing. She's amazing, and that organization is, is doing that. great, great, great things. Um, but, yeah, they, they have a similar model where it's the people on the ground doing the work, and they're mm -hmm. doing the fundraising, and they're getting it to sell. I was thinking about her that whole time you were, you were talking about that. It, it's, a, it's a really strong model. And now I forgot why I even brought her up, actually. Oh, because uh, she was talking about the organ, you know, because they do fund people on the ground, like the local organizations. Um, they see also what happens, like these names shall not be used, but really <laughs> mega, mega NGOs that come in. And it's just, it's like turning a ship. Not that it's necessarily even unethical or not all going to the right place, but it just, it, it's hard to get things to move quickly in the way you'd want them to do when you're moving in such a large, large organization. So you sounds like you've solved that issue. So, uh. Well, we're small enough that our local partners are very much networked and embedded in the local communities that they exist in. Uh, mm. and they're, they're, they're nimble and they, and they know people. Uh, they're, yeah. Once you get... I suppose in any industry beyond a certain size, it is like you say, like like turning right. a ship. So yeah, and it's uh, it, the bigger you get, often the the further removed you are from actually the issue that right. you're setting out to solve. Yeah, and that's not through bad intent. That that no, just it's happens. not a bad intention. It's just the nature. It's just a mo the model really matters how you set up the model. So um, okay, and then but I also read that you have high, you have schools that you have built. Mm. That's a whole nother level, right? We operate, yes, yeah, so we we don't build things unless we have to. Uh, building mm -hmm. is expensive and time consuming and mm -hmm. where possible we use existing infrastructure, for example. Right. Where possible we're sending children to good private schools, uh, but where that's not possible or where there's a potentially revenue generating or sustainability creating reason to build a school, for example, we do mm. that. So hmm. we, over the next two years, will be building a high school in Malawi. We currently operate our own elementary school through our partner in Malawi. Hmm. We'll be, uh, so our partner in Malawi operates an elementary school uh, in hmm. Malawi. And the vision then is to have a high school so children can go right through from the point of intervention or rescue to the end of high school with the same curriculum, teaching style, and all those other services that we talked about earlier, mm. and that that will be a school of sufficient quality to attract the fee-paying students of more affluent families that will make it a at least 
revenue neutral, oh. if not possibly revenue positive. Oh, I love that. Venture. So you've got. Uh, sorry, I totally interrupted you. I'm sorry. No. So you. It. So you've got. Uh, a mixture of types of kids, some that are already maybe from mm. wealthier families going to school with the kids who were in these horrible situations. That's exactly. really helpful. I love so that we, diversity, mixing it all together. Yeah, and there's a, there's a philosophical... Learn a lot. Uh, exactly. Yeah there's, yeah, there's the financial piece of that, that it makes it mm -hmm. instead of paying for everyone to go to a school somewhere, you mm -hmm. can be running a school that effect that pays for itself uh, eventually mm. uh, but philosophically you are providing an education that's of a very high standard but it w but in a school where kids from poverty are getting access to privilege and children from privilege are exposed to poverty so both groups live and lead differently uh, who do you yeah. care about most in the world your yeah. family probably your friends at the very least mm -hmm. people that you know someone you're right. familiar with. Right. So whenever some of the children from more affluent or influential families are being educated with some of the children that we have helped out of, a, of an abuse situation, they would never meet each other otherwise. Just like back in Northern Ireland, that first program I came to the US to mm -hmm. help implement, those people weren't meeting each other ever. Right. Which meant right. they fought with each other. Yeah. Uh, but instead, yeah. a child will make friends with someone in school, they'll go home to their dad and say, Dad, you wouldn't believe what Susan in school is dealing with. You know yeah. the you know the Minister of Justice. You can do something about that. Or you know how to do this. You can so you, That's you, you, very, very cool. Yeah. yeah. The power and of proximity is, is pretty profound. It, it's everything but and but also the power of uh, I don't know what the word is, but longevity I guess, because again I, I worked with Israeli and Palestinian kids and and also like similar groups from the U S going to the middle East and that we would have these programs and they it, always, they don't want to Palestinians, Israelis are hugging, they're kissing. They don't want to leave each other. They hate each other at the beginning. They love each other at the end. And then they go mm -hmm. home and they, they get back under the influence of everyone else and they can't keep, can't keep it up. And they lose that awareness I and mean, they don't lose it completely, but this, that longevity piece, it's it's rare in a program to, and I love that. I think it's the very best thing that you could say about it, you know, because it's it's got staying power. And that's when lives really change and situations change. So that well, that's huge. I think the analogy that I give quite often, patience in philanthropy is mm. sadly quite rare. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned this earlier that often folks want yeah. to see quick impact and Sometimes that you need yeah. them. If there's been an earthquake or there's sure. a famine, yeah. someone needs food at yeah. once. They need food at once. Right. But uh, patience is, is quite rare. And we, we require those who come alongside us are people who realize real change that will last mm -hmm. and endure at a deep level takes time. Mm -hmm. The analogy I like to give is my mother. If my mother was pressed when I was seven years old, if she was pressed to receive to give reasons why I should keep receiving funding as a seven-year-old, She'd be hard pressed to give a good reason, but she believed that maybe if I keep going for another eleven or twelve years here, Thomas might do something worthwhile. So uh, <laughs> we—it's uh, no different to that. Yeah. It takes it. Yeah. Every child whose life we enter, who's six years old, it, it'll be thirty years before they're thirty-six. Uh, they're not probably entering their their peak of influence yeah. for three decades. So yeah. it's, a, it's a long, long, long play. Yeah. You know, one, one, and this is just true with international development in general. Um, I often hear people say that, why should we go help uh, people in Kenya? You know, why they're the, if their government was being, or whatever country it is, if the government is being fraudulent with the money they're getting, they're not helping their own children, why should we help them? And where sometimes it's hard for people they want to and and yes there are people down the street who need help in their mm. own town in denver colorado there are people who need help you see it every day so why should someone take their money and not put it there and why should they put it in another country and i think sometimes people see have difficulty finding that connection to understand how i mean i think just that one little example of if everyone was educated how how it would help climate change, you know, because they would have fewer children, they would use resources better, there'd be less. Yeah. 
but that's not always as compelling as I would like it to be for people. So I don't know if you have any better. Mm. Uh, well, I, we, we do get asked quite often variations of that question. There's, mm. needs, right, there's needs right here. Why, why, mm -hmm. should, why should I give to needs somewhere else? And I usually will say two or three things in response. Uh, first of all, I say, well, if you are, if you write, not, if the spirit of your question is that you're already giving and living sacrificially in your own mm -hmm. community, then keep doing that. Don't, mm -hmm. don't stop. If you're yeah. not, then give more and think about what you want to see happen. Uh, if it is a true story that there are probably more people within 15 miles of, a, of someone in need in Denver mm -hmm. who could meet that need if they chose to than there are people within 15 miles of any child that we serve. Within 15 miles of any child that we serve, uh, there's no one. So it's either uh, us or it's no one. Yeah. Uh, and, and then number three, I'd say, the she if your passion is education, which ours is, mm. you will provide more education per dollar uh, abroad than you will at home. So if uh, it's, but it's, it's a question of the individual and their heart. Yeah. My primary motivation in most of my day to day with many hooks is inspiring or motivating an increase in generosity. Mm. I would love that generosity to come to us because I believe in the effectiveness of what we're doing. But we recommend other organizations all the time, local and yeah. international. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, we, if we all give uh, somewhere yeah. uh, a little more, then yeah. uh, the, the sum total increases. Yeah. Um, I think another question, for some reason I'm having a little trouble hearing all of a sudden. Oh, um, what about now? Uh, it's, I don't think it was on your answer, but it's good. Um, I... Another question that people in America anyway often um, have is that why don't why is education not free in other countries as it is in, in ours? I and and there's often confusion about where the, I was trying to help some people in Belize and there and a woman wrote me and said, but I was trying to help some kids get money for schooling in Belize, which is central near Guatemala. Mm, and I've been to Belize. Um, have you? Yeah. No? It's uh, I just got back from a very long time there, so I got to know oh, it pretty well. I yeah, my you son on. is my son is living there, and I can work anywhere. So I was, he's uh, uh, and he's doing a lot with education there. Like he's doing a lot with the local school system where he lives. But he's he's up there working on a hotel. They're renovating and running a hotel down there. Um, so I lost my train of thought for a second there. Um, okay, so I was trying to raise some money for some people I knew in Belize who to go to school. And just two girls, like small, and uh, a lot of pushback, and even from Belizeans who said it's free, and but it's not free in that we're in this particular place we're living, and and I've just this I this question comes up in a lot of different countries: is it free or is it not free? It seems like there's some confusion there, and if it is free, or if it's not free, why isn't the government paying for their own people to go to school? Mm. Do, do you happen to know the answer to that? Uh, well, there, there, I suppose there are, what, close to 200 countries in, in the world, so the answer will be, will be different in, in different right. ones, right. but there's probably a few categories of things going on. Mm -hmm. In some places, uh, there is simple lack of resources. In Malawi, uh, Malawi is the 12th poorest country in the world. Even if the government wanted to provide quality education for everyone, from kindergarten through to the end mm -hmm. of high school, it, it, someone has to, money to pay teachers has to come from somewhere, and so if people aren't making any money to mm -hmm. pay tax to the government to deliver education, then there's no money to deliver education. So there's that that one category of issue. Right. Another is we talked about it a few times around the around the edges of it. There is corruption and a, and a lack of will quite often mm -hmm. in, in in places where those in power and influence are very far removed from the the ordinary person. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that we are taking the long approach that we are is how do you change that? You could either change the mind of a corrupt or apathetic government official, or you can have gift, become that government official one day, or a child themselves that couldn't access education right. knows what it's like to become that person one day, which is what, mm -hmm. what we're about. Uh, those are probably the two. And then there's a third category where 
if maybe you're, maybe this is what you encountered in Belize, where education, and Kenya is a good example of this, education would be advertised internationally as being free, primary education. And it is free in that there is no school fee, but the, you're for, you have to buy books, everything and uniforms, else. Yes. everything. And yes. If you're living yes, in two, two bucks a day, you can't do that. Right. And then other, and finally, maybe the fourth you, I thing think you hit it. Yeah. where we come in is there are also places where it is free. You don't have to. I, I visited a school in, in Malawi in April of last year, and I've shared the picture with lots of folks of, of a school that's free. And there are children in there. They're all sitting mm -hmm. on the floor. There's probably 110 mm -hmm. in the class with one yeah. teacher with a yellow yeah. dog eared book, and there's not a mm -hmm. desk, there's not a table. Unbelievable. Uh, so yeah. there's education. Yeah. And there's yeah. one of the most heartbreaking things that we see are parents, often it's a mother by herself, who's doing everything in her power to keep herself and her children afloat, sacrificing yeah. to get a uniform, to get her daughter or son in school. And then you visit that school and realize this child is learning nothing. There's 109 others in this classroom without any books this woman is sacrificing in her mind my child's in school but really mm, they may as that, well not be that's oof. hard to see that's yeah, difficult that's to see that's very hard but everybody has a nice looking uniform oh yeah that's they always confusing to me yeah um well a couple of things i just want to uh, you know we're getting close to the end of our time i want to make sure uh you talk about kind of what your ask is for for supporters at many hopes i think um I think I, I think twenty dollars was sort of what you're going for. If everyone could donate twenty dollars mm. or more, can you? What is that twenty dollars? How does that help? How would that twenty dollars be? Helpful? Yeah, we have. And, well, we'd love people to to join in and, and help uh, with whatever yeah. amount that, that they would like. But mm. we've in the film that you watch, the rise of mm. the film, that's specifically focused on providing education where. Uh, in Malawi, uh, twenty dollars a month will send uh, will send a child to elementary school, and thirty dollars mm. a month will send them to high school. And okay. that is that's a pretty meaningful return on a f yeah. accessible investment. We we would say uh, that's yeah. that's sort of the 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 entry point mm -hmm. for those who may want to do more. Like other things that we are currently seeking support for. In Ghana, where we are getting children out of slavery on Lake Volta, like we talked about, it costs us an average of $1,000. It can go to 1300 but an average of $1,000 to get a child off the lake into freedom and to school for the first day. So that's uh, every rescue operation that we run or our, through our partner there, Challenging Heights, targets the rescue of 30 children. So an average rescue is about $30,000 or $1,000 per child. It's so mind-boggling to know that something is illegal and that they still have to be rescued from there. That It's just, it's That's, common knowledge that they are slaves. It's common knowledge. You can see it. You can take pictures of it. Mm -hmm. You have pictures of it in the film. It's illegal it's, in the country, I'm sure, to have child slavery. It's illegal everywhere. It is. So... It's, it's just, against laws, but laws laws yeah. that don't get enforced yeah. may as well not be there. Yeah, it's just, I think, hard for people to believe sometimes that that's the case, but it's very much the case. So many countries. So. But, the, uh, but the, we've seen just dramatic things happen uh, as a result. Well, you, I was in Kenya two weeks ago, I'm back sitting in New York, now, but I was in Kenya two weeks ago, and the, one of the reasons I was there that w was that one of the first children we ever had in a home that we mm. funded, and mm -hmm. one of the first girls that we put through school, uh, her name is Jane, she was graduating university in Nairobi, and it was a very emotional moment to, to sit watching her. I, was, I got to be one of the two, uh, in, one of the three invitations to her graduation ceremony that, 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 that students were allowed. And to see her standing in a, in a gown and a funny hat, receiving a degree, and thinking back 16 years Can't even when imagine. I first met her. Yeah. And anyone who joins the Rising will have that moment at some point for themselves. They will see yeah. somebody come out of university or even start uh, a job after high school that wouldn't have been there 
but for yeah. their, as we say yeah. in the film, but for the cost of a, a streaming service and a sandwich, uh, that, yeah. that's, what, that's what you get. We can all do that if we, we want to. We can all do that. All right. Uh, last question has nothing to do with many hopes. Mm. Well, maybe it does indirectly. Do you find that Irish people have more... It, I feel it, I see a lot of empathy coming from Ireland. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of concern for the underdog. I see them uh, doing things all around the world um, to help other uh. people. And I'm just wondering if coming from Ireland, if you see that as well, or I just, is it something? Because it, it, I think it's a fact. I don't think it's mm -hmm. just a feeling on my part. I think I've seen it too many times. What is that? You, you gave a lot of credit because you, you're the epitome of this. And does, do, you said your family was very mm. big behind your, your upbringing and, and, and your, your love for the world, maybe, and your, your view yeah, of the world's perspective. Well, that's a very interesting thought. I would like to believe that's true, and I, I would like to believe that it wouldn't stay true because uh, mm, everyone else right. would, would start to be the same if it were true. But... There's probably something in it. I remember growing up, even whenever, I remember hearing my, my grandmother talk, who grew up, obviously before me, at a time whenever Ireland was not a prosperous place. It's not like it is mm -hmm. now. Even back then, when mm -hmm. most people had very little, there was still a culture of, of giving. It was mm -hmm. still something that you, that you did. There was, always a, there was always a collection in church to send somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, right. so that's, that's always been there as far as as long as I've been alive. Uh, so I, th and we, we're, we're slight inverted snobs, I think. So we're, we're quite fond of the underdog. So we, we like people to do well, but not too well. So maybe there's a stronger affinity with the underdog than, than average. Yeah. I will yeah. say this though, having lived in both Northern Ireland and the US, the culture of giving and of volunteering runs very deeply in America also. Mm -hmm compared mm -hmm. to most places. Uh, Ireland also, but America compared to most places. The, uh, the, the, the philanthropic and charitable activity here is very, no, it's very, very robust. Strong. Yeah, it really is. I agree with that. Um, so maybe all the Irish that came over have made an impact. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's... There, there's a big chunk of America that, that came from, from Ireland. I don't know what the and percentage think, is, but... And one thing that's probably... I, mean, I referenced earlier my own uh, Christian faith as a strong motivator in what, what I do. And even mm -hmm. though Ireland has become much more secularized in the last two or three decades, there's mm -hmm. a strong culture like mm -hmm. there is in America of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of faith. And part of that like is giving. Is mm -hmm. giving. Yeah. Part of that is yeah. what we have is not our own, so share it. Well, Thomas, uh, I just want to thank you so much just for living the life you have lived and doing the work you've done because you are one person i wrote a book one's called one person acted and everything changed and you're you're mm. the epitome of that it literally takes one person to start something and then you need followers and you need support and you need all those other things of community that come with it but if not for that one person nothing nothing changes mm. so thank you for for being that person well, heavens, uh, uh, well, as, a, as, as someone once said, I, sh I shall take the encouragement and pass the glory on. But, uh, but our hope is that what you just said will apply to every child mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. entered the life of. And everyone mm -hmm. who joins the Rising and supports their kid through school, that one person can go on to do things that we can't even imagine. Just right. I didn't know what was going to happen with many hopes when we started. It was, right. it was a... But you started in, anyway, in, which is the whole point. Incremental, right? day by day, yeah. knowing incremental, that. Incremental, but you had a vision. It had a vision. Oh, yeah. We had a big yeah. vision. We still do. Yeah. We're just getting yeah. started. Yeah. Well, I really encourage everyone watching to uh, watch this film, which I'll put the links to in the show notes. And also, $20 a month will make you feel much, much better about yourself and and the world. So I, I'd really encourage people to give what they can as well. And um, mm -hmm. Thomas, thank you so, so much for, for coming and spending this time. It's it's just been fascinating and inspiring. Yeah, really, you've been really, appreciate uh, it. really enjoyable to talk with. So thank you right. for the invite.
Thank you. Maybe All when right. you're in Denver, we'll do a we'll do a talk here or something. Do you do fundraising in Denver? Oh, I'd love to be in Denver. We have yeah, yeah we have one or two supporters, in maybe three or four families, in fact, in Denver and in Colorado mm. Springs. So we have a mm. and in Boulder, I believe. I've not been there for yeah. years, but I'm free that well. day. Winter time. <laughs> All right. We'll figure it out. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.